Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Well, welcome to Become Famous for What You Do. I am so excited to have my collaborator, friend, we've been authoring things together, come up with ideas to becoming famous for what you do. Welcome, Yamelka. Thank How you. Are you? <laughs> I am great. <laughs> so, so exciting to have you on for this podcast. We've been thinking about becoming famous, fame economy, and fame in all kinds of sorts and forms. In our obsession with that, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about why is it that we think fame is so important today? Yeah, one of the things, it's so interesting, you know, I, I've been um, in the process of kind of finishing the book and wrapping it up, and I was looking for some quotes of fame, and it's so amazing. They are so negative. I mean, the, 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 the word fame is so negative. I felt, and you know, I was trying to avoid the ones, but you know, it's so interesting how we took fame from being something so wonderful. You know, we talk, we talk about, or you talk about specifically about about Socrates and how he felt that fame was something honorable and and how we've turned it into being something so negative. And so I think my goal here, and I think yours is too, is to make this more of a positive word because it is positive. It's it's yeah. great to, to be known for, for what you do. And so it, it should be more of an honorable impact, positive word. Now, isn't that interesting? Um, why do you, because what I think is so interesting with you and why our collaborations have been so powerful is you really sense the obstacles we have for becoming famous for what we do, shining the light. And, and would you want to elaborate on that? I think that's such an interesting component that you talk about. Yeah, I think just like fame, right? And it's interesting when I ask, um, my on my podcast, I asked the the, list, the the guests to to tell me a fame a fame story, their fame story, and it's so interesting. They they kind of reject it at times. Sometimes they're just very natural. Oh yeah, I have a fame story, and sometimes it's like, well, I'm not famous, but it's really about being comfortable. You know, not just with the word fame, but in general. And I think when um, I have clients and when we go through the branding process that I go with them. I see that they struggle with this um, wanting to to be more out there with what they can do and help people with, but also kind of go back. So they go forward 10 steps, they go backward 20 steps, and it's that dance of forward and backwards that um, that we do with, with, with the clients. And I think it's that fear of, and, and I understand this because I had it myself, you know, even when we did that wonderful um, uh, Facebook uh, project that you had us do where we went live on Facebook, <laughs> you know, the first few times, it's scary, right? It's and, and you're just talking to friends, right? But it's still scary. You're getting on the camera and you're kind of freaking out. Um, and I think it's the same when clients start to put themselves out there as a brand is they they're scared of you know what people will say how people will look at them if people will think that you know they're not smart i don't know what it is there's so many things that they're they're afraid of and you see the potential in the client you see the potential that they have that they have this amazing thing that they can do and thrive and then they're just confronted by this wall and and it becomes you know. like static they like freeze freeze i know right. isn't that interesting it's it's like uh because what we always talk about you and i is that we're saying that fame economy that we're living in today is where you have to show your personal self your official self all into one and really you're the one that sells the product or services and yet we're so hesitant to it and yet we want to be real 
Uh, it's just so interesting. And how do you, because you're a brand therapist, and I love that you, as I like to call it, you heal brands, you help brands to thrive, you you give them a health check, and you give them some vitamins of telling them a little bit about the archetypes and so forth. So what have you, what have you seen, and how do you unleash that through through what you do? So um, one of the things that I have seen in kind of being this brand therapist, um, taking my um, clients, putting them on the couch, have them relax, <laughs> and kind of talking to them is that um, there's this uncovering, you know, like um, we do with this uncovering of self, this um, a revealing of, of their true personality, like this, uh, shedding that um, mm -hmm. those layers that we put on ourselves of who we are these identities right we we fill ourselves up with these certain identities and and we don't want people to see our true self and we don't do that to be completely honest we don't do that consciously we do that at the unconscious level and with this you know brand therapist and psychology piece that that I add to what I do uh, psychology is all about bringing the unconscious to the conscious, right? That's, that's how neuroscience works. And if you look at it, um, we, we only do use 3% of our conscious mind. And there's this 97% that we are not using at a conscious level. And so what I do with, with, um, with the archetypes and everything that I do is peeling those layers, right? Getting to that unconscious mind so they can bring that authenticity back and forward. And sometimes you have to do a lot of work with people on that because they're not, um, they're either heckle and jive, they have seven personalities, and so you don't know which one they're using that day, or they're kind of covering it up in the personality that they feel more comfortable with that isn't necessarily their true or authentic essence. And again, like I said, people don't do this at a conscious level. They do this at an unconscious level. So my job is to peel those layers so they can see their amazing self. And when they're able to show up without holding back and really show their authentic self, everything else is so easy. It comes so much easier. Well, it's interesting you say that because that's what that's how you and I met was, um, you know, I thought I knew myself. And when you're in this in this place, I realized I need to hire someone like me. So I ended up hiring you to help me uh, uncover myself. And it was so interesting because you have this really amazing method of using the archetypes. You've got these brilliant questions that really hones down to the source of who you are. And I just remember how like I thought I was this serious person. I thought I was all these things. And if you look at my podcast cover now, it completely reflects what you were telling me a year ago. And I didn't want to listen to you. It was just so funny. And then it's like, no, I don't like yellow. And then if you look at my cover, it's got lots of yellow. No, I don't. And look, you have yellow glasses. I know, and I got yellow glasses. <laughs> and being colorful was, I was the serious catering to the engineers and and it takes time to take that truth in, if you know what I mean. Uh, and so it was fascinating process. And I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about the archetypes, because I've never, in all the surveys I've ever done about me or used to my clients, this is the most effective that I've ever found. And so clearly find it. And yet, I got so frustrated with you. <laughs> I got yeah, frustrated I, with, with I, the findings, right? You know, it's so interesting because, um, you know, with you and some of my other clients, it's funny because when I tell them, they're like, uh, they're either say yes, or if they have that struggle, right, between their actual personality, they're like, no, I, I might be that word, but not these two words, right? And, and I think the process over time, I've been using this for the last 20 years, has revealed a lot of things for me. Um, I started using this. First of all, let me just say, I read um, Carol Pearson's book, The Hero and the Outlaw, and that's what really got me interested. A friend of mine had recommended it. 
And I was just awed by the book and how it could be used for marketing. And so I started using it. I worked at Procter & Gamble for many years and used it on all my products and all my teams. And I would make them really pick an archetype because what happens is when you're working with a team, especially at a corporate level, um, the the product has 50 personalities right because nobody can agree or nobody can like really focus in so really getting the team aligned on the particular personality um and so the archetypes there's 12 um and it's um so so what happens is we how do i say it's like archetypes are in in us it's like a memory bank i love you know what what um, Carl Jung has done with these. Now, the difference between Carl Jung and Fre um, Freud, let me tell you the difference. Carl Jung believed in the collective unconscious, right? That there's this collective or this bank of memories that we have, um, whether it's in our womb or before, I mean, past lives, I mean, there's all these kind of theories around that. And Freud believed that we can create whatever personality that we wanted to create. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference is that Carl Jung believed that we are one. We're all connected in some way or another. And Freud didn't. And so what I wow, love about what Carl isn't that powerful? Oh my I mean, God. that I is what I didn't realize it until now. That totally fits in with the quantum, the quantum studies and everything. Exactly. And that's why a lot of people are using psychology and Carl Jung studies and what he's done to really understand what happens with your brain and neuroscience and all those things. And these archetypes are ingrained in us, right? We can't take them away. And that's why I love psychology. And so you can see, you know, people think, oh, well, you're putting me in a box, but I'm not really putting you in a box. All I'm doing is bringing out your true personality. So some people might be caregivers. Some people might be lovers. Some people might be outlaws, magicians. We have sages. We have innocent. We have girl next door, good guy. We have the creator. We have the explorer. We have the hero. We have the, the, uh, the performer. And so all these archetypes, they, they, they live with, with, within us, but we have one particular one that we're really attracted to. Actually, two, when you make it a little bit more complex, as you know. And then those archetypes live in quadrants. Right. And, and these are universal, what we call universal frameworks. So, um, with universal frameworks, you always get the same. It's something that you can use consistently and get the same answer. So that's why we use these universal frameworks. And then we put the archetypes in those frameworks and we start to see the patterns, right? Psychology is all about patterns and we study them and we see what's happening. And that gives us a consistency in the answer. So I found through understanding that methodology, I started to see the patterns within people. And so that was really interesting to me. And that's how I started helping people with their personal brand because I was using this for products, but it's best used with people. I mean, we were turning products into people because that's what people have to do because the only way you connect is you connect to people, right? Because we have vocabulary, we have language, we have all those things, your expertise, communication. And so that's really how we can communicate. But we were creating these products and then we were developing personalities. So personal branding is just showing the world who you actually are at your foundation, at the true essence, you know, how we call this fame essence and, and the fame character and all these things, because it really starts there. It does. It really, really does. And it was interesting because I didn't believe you. And you remember how I did this social media test where we put it on Instagram, we had an, um, we had an intern help us out and she did the social media for us for something called the bestseller mastermind and it went from zero to 600 in two weeks just by using the color using the branding that fit me and it was outstanding uh, it was kind of frustrating that someone can peg you so well right you get kind of like wait i'm so unique and i think that's why people get tempted by freud is that you can be anything you want but yet you're more powerful when you actually go to the essence. And I love this. I never really got it until now when you said it to you, Malka, the collective conscious, that, that we do have a collective conscious. We have these roles that we all understand and we all live by. And it's really 
taking the power of who we are. That's really powerful. Exactly. And what what I love about that is is that the more you understand yourself and the more that you are consistent, the more people trust you. And, and, and we do this at an unconscious level, right? The more we see people the same way, the same message, and you know this, you're, you're a message expert. And we do this consistently over time, we start to see people are attracted to that. Um, it's hard to gain an audience um, or gain a tribe when you're trying to talk one way and then the other and then another. People don't trust you because you're, they're like, well, who are you? Or you're this one day and then you're that the other day. I don't know who you are, right? But it's so interesting you say that because you and I have worked on several clients and it's so hard and I know even with myself to choose the one thing, right? To, to, to be consistent, maybe you're consistent with multi-passions, but it's hard to be consistent. And we've had some clients that get really tempted because as we shed the layers, all these opportunities come to them and they don't know how to say no. Exactly. And so, so that's, that's a really good one there, um, that you, that you really folk, uh, kind of, um, came to the forefront is that when you're, tr your true self, you're going to get all these things coming to you because now you've shown who you are. And we don't really recognize that or sometimes don't know how to use our gifts. And, and that's when you, you've got to decipher. Do I go this way? Do I go that way? But you have to do it at a conscious level. You can't just say yes to everything because it came to you. You have to be in, like you say, you have to be strategic. Like what's the strategy at the end, right? The end goal. So think about what's the destination and how do you get to the, that destination is through the strategy. And if you're just going to pick everything, you're, you're going to do zigzags or, you know, you're not going to go to your ultimate goal. But you've worked a lot with big companies that you said had like 50 different brands and all these various menus of choices. How do you get a company or a person to decrease and actually get down to one choice and be consistent? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really great question. Now, when I started my career, I mean, we're, we were, we're, we are still one of the biggest branding companies in the world. And, um, they, you know, they've done a great job before I started, but what I started to see is that, you know, Procter & Gamble was so focused at performance, performance-driven um, benefits. Um, and so really bringing in these characters was a little different thing for them. Um, and, but, but they understood them, obviously, they had whole um, frameworks and things around the character. But one of the things that I started to see is that people didn't understand what that meant, especially the engineers and, and the multifunctional teams, right? Those, those frameworks were for the advertising agencies or for the marketing people. And so what, what I, what I started to do is creating a persona and really focusing on that, what I call the super fan, that opposite, really understanding who, who was our client, not at a macro level, but a micro level. You know, a lot of times at PNG, we say, Oh, we, we talk to people, you know, our product focuses on people 20 to 50. And it's like 20 to 50. Yeah. Like that sounds like, you know, um, porridge or uh, <laughs> oatmeal, like vanilla. I mean, you can't, you can't be unique and different if you're, if you're targeting so many people. So really focusing down on the super fan, what I call a super fan, making that person real and have feelings and, and how they think and understand and how they do things, really getting to the micro level of that gives you this opportunity to create these unique instances, this unique products. That doesn't mean, and you know, that doesn't mean you're not going to attract other people. It just means that the more focused you are on that message that you're trying to pursue, the more uh, differentiation and positioning you will be able to have in the market and not be a vanilla where everybody's like, if you're vanilla, you're not going to get anybody. You have to be unique and different. And in a way that you attract that right individual magnetically. And it's so exciting because uh, that's uh, when we, what we always say, you and I, is that the greatest difference is you, right? No one can, exactly. no one can really compete with you. And kind of like 
Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the fame economy and how you see it, because that's something we talk quite a bit about. And why is it that you really need to become famous for what you do? Why you need a brand therapist to find your fame essence and fame character? Yeah. So, I, I mean, you talk about this much better than I do, but uh, the fame economy came after the experience economy, right? So we were talking about experiences, really delivering on experiences, but then all of a sudden social media blew out of um, extremely, it, I don't think anybody expected to really see social media go out as far as it did through Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and uh, you know, we had MySpace in the beginning and all these things that kind of started happening around that. And now we weren't just talking to the people on media. Um, we were talking to the people outside of that. We had our own audience. We had our own, um, uh, we had our own stage, right? And so I think, I think with that started the, what we call the, the fame economy is really, you could become famous, like you say, for, for what you do and, and really show your expertise. And, and if you think about it, there's so many different things now that people do. It's like, you hear something and you're like, oh, there's actually a job for that, you know, and it's all these, uh, these new things and, and, and that, that is created from the fame economy. It's because you can become famous for what you do and then have that niche, have that unique element that you bring to the table and you can only bring that because you are the product that you are. And so that gives you a, um, a, a, a like um, what we would call, it gives you the space to really develop that essence, that sense of who you are. And that's, that's really what the fame economy is, that we can all become, we can use what the world has given us, technologies, innovations, and use that to do give our own gifts, our our legacy, what we want to leave behind for others and helping others to really get there. And I think it's interesting you say that because, yeah, we talked about the fame economy uh, and that we have to, like, be out front and center. What is, as a brand therapist, as you list and you have your clients on the couch, so to speak, and you're listening to their obstacles, what has been the, what has been, like, a uniform obstacle or is there something that sticks out to you that you've really learned by listening to all these brands on the couch <laughs> yeah that's that's a really great question yes there is a common theme around them and I will say at the beginning they understand the concept they understand you know their they're loving it. They're really thriving. Um, we're creating, you know, their brand visually and strategically and everything's coming together and they're really loving the process and they're getting along. And then all of a sudden, when it's time to launch, they all, everybody does this. I mean, every single one of my clients, they, they freeze and they're like, Oh, uh but what are people going to say? I'm not sure I'm ready for for this. This is going to be a lot of work. I mean, I hear all kinds of excuses, right, for not launching, for not putting ourselves out there. But if we don't do it, we're the only one that's going to not benefit is ourselves. You know, no, why do you think okay. it is? Because it is such human nature, and I think that's one of the things when you and I are working together. We, I, at least for me, I was kind of not taking that so much into consideration and realize now you need to make more room for that process of handling the fear of being out in front and center. And and we can't, and I love what one of our clients says, Bjorn Aureli says, fear is not dangerous, right? But yet, right. But yet we feel it's dangerous. And so we don't do anything, we don't act. And, and, what, and you've taken some, a lot of extra courses and so forth to help clients with that. Yeah, so I when I started seeing that pattern, 
I decided to do a neuro-linguistic programming, timeline therapy, and hypnosis. And the reason why I decided to do that was because, um, for the benefit of my clients, because it didn't make any sense for them to pay me all this money and then not use all the things we created, right? For, and, and I just felt like, I don't want to be paid and then you not use this. The whole point <laughs> is that you pay me and then you use it, right? Yeah. And so I, there was this, um, I started to see, um, how this was not letting them be in uh, who they were and leave this legacy and this impact and these amazing things that they were going to do. And so I decided to take that um, certification so I could help them at a deeper level, at a psychological level, right? So they can start to understand those limiting beliefs that they had about themselves, those li limiting concepts. I mean, if we don't really understand what limits us, then we can't move forward. No. And, um, and at the time, again, like I said before, we do this at such an unconscious level that we don't even know we have limiting beliefs. We don't even know we're being, um, we're being limited to what we can do. And so getting rid of those negative emotions is the first thing we do is getting rid of the negative emotions that you have in your body. And these negative emotions can be there from 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 when we don't even know this like we wouldn't we wouldn't even know like it could be in the womb it could be in a past life it could be you know in different places in our in our in our collective consciousness mm -hmm. or unconsciousness and and so then we we kind of nip it and say okay this is where it started and so we talk through that to kind of get rid of that. And then we go to limit and beliefs and we go through the beliefs and we, and we go through this process of, um, getting rid of our uncovering that belief. And then we try to start to delete all those beliefs because they're not real. We think they're real. It's like you said, it's not even there. And we, we feel like it's there. And so once we uncover those, then it's the job of the, of the hypnosis to really bring us to this reprogramming of our system, of our brain, of who we are, bringing our true essence back and bringing that in an everyday life. It's like forming this habit around who you are and your message and what you do so then you can thrive. It's in so this interesting world. you say and, that because it, I, I, Miles Davis has a great quote that I'm actually going to be, I just found, and I'm so excited I'm going to use it in the book, but he says, uh, it took me years to find my, to become myself. Right? <laughs> yeah. and, and I thought, and isn't that funny? Because we're taught in life, just be yourself, right? Just be yourself. Just go out there and be yourself. And what I've learned from working with you and working with this for so long is it's a process of finding you. And I think that's something people don't realize in this world is that, Finding you takes time. It's like Grant Cardone said, it took him 10 years to figure out his branding, right? Um, and I think we don't give ourselves time enough to go on that journey with you or and be helping out or some of us that are doing this because we go straight to the tactics of the program, the business, everything we want to do. And we fail at those programs because we haven't done these steps. Yep. Exactly. And, and, you know, it takes time, it does take time to get there. But if you find the right person and the right method, you can get there so much faster, right? When we were working together, we could get a client from zero to a 100 in, you know, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, depending on how fast they could go, right? Right? Because we got to the essence. But if you don't get to that essence, it's like if you don't cut it, at the root, it's gonna it's gonna keep growing, and it's gonna keep growing in different ways and in different paths. And so you've got to really find that essence, find that core where you can start. And I see a lot of clients; they've done all this work, all this branding, and and I'm like, it's not right. No, because you know, it's super back. Right? It's superficial. Yes. It's like the color, the look, and wait what and that's what i love so much about the study between coke and pepsi same product different feel 
they have a different essence, right? And that's and that's kind of what uh, what you do quite uh, in a very very powerful way. It's very yeah, it's trying really finding that their true essence, so we can move this product fast and 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 with them in mind. You know, a lot of people who you hire to do whether it's a logo or a website, you know, you hire them, and they are doing it. F- feels like for somebody else and i'm like where is the person where is the individual and that's what you do you find the individual so uh i think we're going to be coming to close and i just thought what i like to ask people in the end is who is a a famous person that you've really really like and you really um has has talked to you in a certain way yes i love coco chanel and yes, I'm a big fashion person. And look, right behind me, Chanel. Um, if you can see that really big. Oh, that you see right bold. away. <laughs> and I love who she is as a person because she was so bold. She didn't care what people thought about her. Um, she was able to find her true essence and just be who she was. Right, she wasn't worried about her past or what happened. People were always trying to find out who is this woman. Let's find her. You know why is she the way she is, and it's like she's the way she is because that's her essence. That's who who she is at the core. She was able to follow that and be bold and forward with it. You know she did so many amazing things. She was doing hats and clothing and dressed all these people. Look at where the brand is now. It lives beyond her death, right? And and she's truly this icon. And and not just in 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 from a from an outfit standpoint, but also from perfume. Who who doesn't know about Chanel number no. five? It's it's the most famous perfume in the world. And and I love how she thought about she launched it, you know, on May fifth, you know, the fifth month, the fifth day. I mean, she had a whole strategy around how she wanted to do this and what she wanted to do. She didn't want to have a scent that was just, you know, what everybody else was doing. She really took on that um, creative mind and put these these specific flowers and these different things together that were very complex in, it, in its time and kind of form that and if you think about it not just Chanel number no. five but if you you know look at Chance or Mademoiselle if you ask somebody what's what's the perfume that they use it's usually one of those one of those three um, or at least most people have Chanel number no. five I know you have it I do um, I bought it when you got me inspired I was like oh my gosh when I read about it I never really was interested in her until you highlighted her to me and I was like wow there's something so powerful with a perfume that's lived so long and sells I think it's every 30 seconds one bottle around the world it's it's imp- it's amazing what she did it is pretty amazing what she what she's done and inspired so many people and she started late in her life you know and uh and she she didn't have the money but she was persistent and obviously she had the craft um she had the imagination she had the vision for where she wanted to go so as a last question before what do you want to become famous for what is what you want to become famous for what is it that you do that you would like to become famous for yeah, so that's a really good question. I was like, okay, now, now I'm being asked the question that I ask. Uh, so I really want to become famous for uh, helping people with their brand, having this and having this method be a staple at you know universities and at mo- mostly design universities because I feel like people um, overlook design. And really the value of what that brings to people. And if you can, if you can understand um, the visual sense of something, I think it can really give you, like we say, right? A picture's worth a thousand words. 
and um, and everything, you know, the theme and all that, if we really dig deep and understand that, we could attract more and we could do more. And I think we put that on the side, right? Let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the data. And, and I think people forget about really looking at the essence, the visuals, the the theme, the metaphors, uh, all those things that really um, feed us from a much more of a feeling side of things versus a thinking side of things. So that's really what I would want to be known for is pushing this theory, pushing this method, this fame method, and integrate it into universities so people could use it and really understand how they position themselves in the world so we can all have an impact. That's fantastic. So where can we find you? Yeah, so you can find me at bespokebranding.io. Um, IO stands for input and output. So it's really interesting. I decided to pick IO because it is a little different than .com. And, and so if you remember that, you'll find me. You can also find me at Yamilka Rodriguez Branding and Instagram or Yamilka Rodriguez on LinkedIn or Yamilka Rodriguez on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> so, so you can find me. I, I probably, like you and I, right, we have very unique names. So just look for Yamilka and I'm sure you'll find me with a C. With but a so C. <laughs> what I think is key too is uh, how can they find you if they wanted to learn more about the archetype and using your services, which would be the best place? Your website, Bespoke Agency then? Yes, bespokeagency.io. Oh, okay. You can take the quiz um, and then just look at, um, there's different archetypes on there. You can look through them and find them and, and, and see which one is yours. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thank yes. you so much, Jamelka. That was wonderful. Thank you, Torin. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keeping bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time.